Good morning, everybody. Who do we got here? I see Pedro. I see Ivar, Julius, Michelle, Ribney, Return of the Mac. Welcome, guys. Welcome, Red Morning, on this wonderful Saturday winter morning. Um, so we finally show you who Carl... <laughs> no. <laughs> right now, we got Carl coming in. Hopefully later, we'll see what happens. No, this is not what like Carl is behind the mask. But with us, we got Dr. Seeger here. Um, I guess I'll do a quick little thing. So for those of you guys that don't know, I make fun all the time of guys who take cold showers to be more masculine and uh, what do they call them? The cold knuckle puss ups in the shower. Well, it turns out I was completely wrong. <laughs> 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 and supposedly a cold shower is actually good for you. So doc, please <laughs> enlighten me, enlighten the pleb here. Why should I be freezing my ass off when I need to get clean? I'm not saying you should be freezing your ass off when you need to get cleaned. Um, I'm not saying you should even be clean. I started, cold, cold showers are just a gateway to masculinity. When you're ready, you can get into the tub with the ice and the 32 degrees and the cubes all over your skin, and then you'll feel masculine. Uh, cold showers are just like the warm-up to masculinity, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should have been given that speech and not me back in 2018. Jeez. All right. I don't know what you might have said in 2018, but I saved my knuckle push-ups for after the ice bath. <laughs> Let's say I got the order wrong. That's the issue. All right. But I guess um, the best way to put it is the, <clears throat> excuse me, Morosco, Morosco Forge is the site. You guys see it in the description there. Walk me through the cold exposure and why is this an athlete specific thing or is this for the average kind of person for health? Yeah, I'm glad you bring it up. Most people who have any familiarity with deliberate cold exposure do it for sports and muscle recovery. And the science on that is mm, it basically, if you enjoy it, if it feels good, then do it. If you're a triathlon guy and your knees are aching and you want to get into the ice bath to help you feel better and reduce some inflammation, then do it. But there's no definitive evidence that the ice bath for muscle recovery is going to improve your performance. Oh, what it, right. oh, sorry, go ahead. What it does instead is a whole bunch of other metabolic and psychological things. So we we started Mirage Co Forge not because we wanted to sell to the big time athletes or we wanted to hawk it as a way to make you stronger and faster in whatever your sport is. It's the psychological and the metabolic benefits that um, that we're really pushing. So when you go to our website, you go to our blog, you're not going to see anything about exercise recovery. You're only going to see things about the thyroid and about brown fat and about ketones and about cancer. Oh, see, that's interesting because uh, honestly, the only thing I've ever heard about it is guys swear that after heavy workouts with all the lactic acid buildup that you'd switch from a hot environment to a cold environment back and forth. And the idea is that uh, constricts and dilates your soft tissue transport systems and your blood vessels, helping get waste products out. But you're there saying that's not really love it for that. That's not why I'm doing it. Yeah, but it uh, does work for that as well. You, I, th I think if it works for you, I mean, if guys swear by it, then let them do it. Um, yeah, but that sounds like a placebo, routine, though, doesn't it? Oh, don't knock the placebo. The pl <laughs> placebos are freaking awesome. So <laughs> if it's a placebo, I'll take it. Um, but there's more to it. The last one we just put up there was called reversing type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes has reached pandemic proportions in our developed countries. We have kids with type 2 diabetes. And it's not just a function of obesity. It's a function largely of what they're eating. So this is a study that came out of Germany. They took 10 middle-aged guys, average age 53 years old, mm -hmm. and they said, do not exercise. They said, we're going to feed you a bunch of snacks. All you have to do is spend a few hours in a t-shirt and shorts at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, to me, that sounds like a tailgate party. You're sitting around with your friends and you're eating snacks and you're not exercising and it's chilly. In, in America, yeah. we would call that football season. <laughs> 10 days later, their glucose sensitivity has improved 43%, which is 
a huge step on the way to reversing their type 2 diabetes. There's metabolic reasons for it. When you get cold, there are two ways that your body tries to keep yourself warm. The first one is shivering. Right. And shivering takes your blood glucose levels way down. Type 2 diabetes is elevated blood glucose. So your muscles are shivering and they're using up all that glucose. Helps you manage your blood sugar. The second way is after prolonged, I shouldn't say prolonged, repeated. After repeated cold <laughs> exposure. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't prolonged when you do it, uh, hypothermia? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but when you do it regularly, um, your body recruits what's called brown fat. And brown fat has extra mitochondria subcells in it so mm -hmm. that it, your brown fat can burn stored fat just to generate heat. That's It's not shivering, it just uses up fat. So those two metabolic activations will take you out of the metabolic disease that so many people in the developed world are suffering from and return you back to what your body was evolutionarily prepared to do. That's without exercise and without changing your shitty diet. Now that is pretty powerful stuff. So that would, is that somewhat explaining the reason why the, uh, the Bible belt, that very warm tropical section of the States is always known for being the fattest one. They just don't have any cold weather to deal with. Uh, I don't know, but you're right. When you do that geographic, you know, prevalence of obesity, prevalence of type two diabetes down in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama, Alabama it's awful. The, mm -hmm. And I don't think it's because they're not playing hockey. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things going on down there. Uh, there's poverty, there's the vestiges of racism, but you have a good point. Racism makes people fat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it has to do with what you have available to eat oh. um, and it, and I'm not just talking black on white when the English were promulgating a systematic genocide of the Irish what did they make the Irish eat potatoes it was the cheapest thing it was where you get the most calories per unit acre of crop and there isn't any damn nutrition in them once the potato crop failed, the Irish die. They have to move to wherever, anywhere in the British. The point is that these vestiges of racism have uh, implications for access to the food that the disadvantaged people have. But your point is, is it because they don't have winter? And yeah, well, is it a factor? I guess I can't. Yeah, I always hate being that guy that's like, oh, that's the magic pill. If it wasn't for the cold shower, the West would be saying, you know what I mean? I don't want to be yeah. too hyperbolic. I so I don't know, but I, I will say this. Um, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. It's mm -hmm. the hottest city in the United States. And there's something here called Phoenix wimps. Because after you've been down here for a couple of years, it's, uh, you know, 45 degrees C, 50 degrees C. I'm trying to, you know, translate for you uh, Canadians. But for the rest of us, that's about <laughs> 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And you lose all your brown fat, you lose your cold acclimation, and then you fly up to Chicago and it's like 55 degrees. Well, you guys are playing Frisbee in your shorts. Once you've been in Phoenix for a couple of years, it's like, oh, I need my winter coat. So there's something about cold acclimation and that regular cold exposure, which changes your metabolism. Now I'm doing cold baths every day, even though it's the winter in Phoenix, it's changed my body fat composition. I've lost a ton of weight. My blood work is in great shape. So whether I'm more masculine or not, I don't give a shit. When I get my blood work back, I know I'm healthier. Dude, that makes sense too. Cause we had that when I was deployed, we had to go down to Dubai, which hit, I think the max temperature we had there was 54 degrees, which I, oh, I got to convert that's that awful. to American. I want to say it's like in the one thirties or plus. Yeah, that sounds about right. But yeah, it was because it was a, we sailed down there. It took us about three months of moving across the climate. So we got acclimatized to it, at which point 54 degrees wasn't wasn't nearly as hot as I thought it was. Because I remember back home, just a nice 30 degree summer and I'd be sweating my bag off. Yep. But it makes sense that it would also work for the cold. Correct. And I am sure, and you are right, it's definitely metabolism was a factor. I was able to sweat and run like a madman. And then when I got home, everything was freezing, even though at the time I lived in Victoria, which is basically Seattle. Yeah. You've been to right. Seattle, but that's like a, a mild 14 or 70 degrees every day, all day. 
you don't see drizzle. snow until you get up into the mountains over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting. Now, I kind of feel bad that I've been ripping on cold showers this entire time. Turns out there's actually a little bit to it. <laughs> well, the showers for me, I started with showers and it was really freaking tough. I started because I read Mike Cernovich Gorilla Mindset. Yeah, yeah. And he was talking about how he was in the shower and he had to do, he had to relax himself. I got into the cold showers this a couple years ago and I would just be like, fuck you, Mike Cernovich. Um, because his <laughs> hey, book- we've had that same. <laughs> Right? <laughs> His book is a real challenge. Um, but I was trying to do some things in my life at the time, so I gave it a shot. I find the cold showers are really hard because one part of your body is getting cold and the rest of it is just wet. When I go up to my neck in the ice, it's much easier to relax. It's the only way I meditate. We've got some good brainwave data on what happens when people get into the cold and their brain activity goes right down into the meditative state that a lot of people are trying to practice so they can achieve. We've got other data on what's happening and it's not exercise recovery. It's about the psychology, the metabolism. And one of our first customers, he's up in Portland, he swears that cold exposure cured his incurable leukemia. I was like, okay, uh, you know, whatever works for you. And then I started doing some uh, reading on the metabolic theory of cancer. It turns out that cancer feeds off of glucose. You need two things to fuel a cancer cell, glucose and insulin. And the ice bath helps with both of those things by bringing your glucose down, your insulin uh, sensitivity or effectiveness up. And it turns out that ketones are toxic to cancer cells. Now, uh, what are ketones? cancer cells are we talking? Because I know there's a lot of different types. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, and if I recall correctly, it's something like 80% of cancer cells fall into this category. And his mm-hmm. happened to fall into this category. But I can't speak for all cancers. Once you take the glucose down, you mm-hmm. starve the cancer cells. Once you activate your brown fat to burn the white fat, you produce ketones that are toxic to the cancer cells. So it started to click for me what he was talking about, how he was going to die of leukemia. His wife died of brain cancer. He said he wanted to swim the Shannon River in Ireland as an inspiration to other terminally ill cancer patients. And he started training in the Williamette River in Oregon. He trains for several months. He goes back to his doctor. He says, Doc, I think I'm ready to do it. Can, am I am I all right to fly over to Ireland? Doc says, let's just check things out. Doc comes back with the blood test. He says, where did your leukemia go? And it's because he starved the cancer cells and poisoned the cancer cells with his own natural chemotherapy called ketones. His name is Dean Hall. You can read about him on our website. And you might say, well, you know, that's one miraculous case. And you'd be right. Um, I'm now looking for more. Yeah, well, I mean, that's... Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I'm doing the red pill thing, and that's essentially what it is. A lot of guys just doing anecdotal data points, which isn't... And you you admit yourself, too, this kind of stuff. It's not scientifically rigorous, but... And I wish I could remember the name of it. Like, it's like convergence theory, where, yeah, even if the data collection isn't perfect and the methods aren't perfect, if you're doing it enough times with enough people and it's pointing in the same direction, it gives you a greater sense of certainty. That sounds right. For yeah, me, you have to forgive. My science is really bad. Don't worry about it. The, the, the science and experience. The point is, we start with experience. And don't deny other people's experiences. If this is what's happened for them, then that's what's happened. When we reduce it, when no, I shouldn't say reduce it, but when we create um, systematic investigations of people's experience, we discover what's generalizable across other people. So science is one way of organizing knowledge, and it doesn't or it, or it shouldn't refute experience. Experience leads us to new hypotheses. Yeah, well, that's the thing, and that's the tricky part I find is where uh, how do you separate? anecdotal evidence from I guess superstition I know yeah I know I know you've heard of this yep. uh, that pigeon experiment where they randomly so, gave pigeons food pellets I told you my science knowledge is really pleb keep level. going yeah. yeah so they randomly would disperse food to these pigeons and then after a couple of weeks what they were noticing is that the pigeons were developing all these 
rituals and superstitions and little dances, thinking that that was what helped them get the food pellet when in reality it had nothing to do with it. Why do you gotta go picking on pigeons? Uh, pigeons, you know, like- I don't know why they picked on pigeons. Do the pigeon dance and the food shows up, I'm <laughs> gonna do the dance. I had a conversation with my oldest child. I say my child, I married a single mother with a kid. And so I helped raise her child. And we can talk about how that turned out. But at this time, he's like seven or eight years old. And he says, Tom, Santa Claus isn't real. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> you look like you're going to fight him. How? Right? I mean, I, yeah, exactly. I'm like, how do you know Santa Claus isn't real? He goes, well, because, you know, it doesn't make any sense, and the kids at school say it, and besides, you're the one who puts the presents. I said, all right, let's talk about the presents. Do you get presents under the tree? He goes, yeah. Do the tag say, from Santa Claus? He goes, yeah. I say, does that work for you? He goes, yeah. I say, well, how do you feel about Santa Claus now? He says, I'm okay with Santa. <laughs> the point is... I can't believe he just it, bullied an eight-year-old. <laughs> but it works for him. Oh, yeah, no, don't get me wrong. It works. That's the placebo effect. I guess that's not the placebo effect, but we're kind of delving towards that, which is curious to me. So I love it. If it you works, are, it works. I yeah. I'll say the same thing, too. At the same time, it's kind of like, Obviously, most guys aren't going to have leukemia from the for the rest of their lives. But you are right with the adipose tissue, which actually makes a lot of sense in my redneck town where we were all freezing our asses off. Um, oh, damn it. I got to quit my train of thought here. We got a quick super chat from <laughs> Jack Donovan's butt plug. Um, do you know about Dr. Jack Cruz? No, but I'm willing to learn. I'm writing his name down right now. All right. I haven't, I haven't heard of him myself either, but... Uh, Anyways, uh, so yeah, we'll look into it. We'll get you an answer for that one, Jack, best we can. Oh, that was my question. So yeah, you're right. The guy with the leukemia story, that's an awesome story. And hopefully it's, it's not the pigeon dance. It's something that actually has an effect or it turns out the uh, placebo was that strong. My question is then, so for the average guy, you're talking about bringing down insulin levels so you don't get diabetes. We're talking about weight loss. Because I mean, yeah, the adipose, adipose is the brown fat, right? Yep. Yeah. Bringing down adipose fat is still bringing down fat. So it is a way to help drop weight. If you're going to be working out and eating right anyway, some cold weather to drop an extra, you know, 2000 calories over the course of two months isn't a bad thing. Hey, John, uh, quickly to Pedro here. Can somebody increase T levels naturally or is that BS? I mean, I could take that one too. Yeah. yeah. Like working out does it. Absolutely. That you can absolutely increase T levels. And most men, like you say, they don't have leukemia. But most men in the developed world suffer from chronically low testosterone and people are telling them, well, it's fine. It's normal. It's only normal because everybody's doing it. It doesn't mean that it's healthy. Dude, that's screwed up, isn't it? I saw yeah. that when uh, they were finding that there was such a low level of average testosterone that instead of calling it a crisis, they just dropped normal, which I, it makes sense because when they call low testosterone a disorder, they just mean outside of the norm of the population. So obviously they're going to move the scale to meet the norm. But it's right. just messed up how that worked. I agree. Had and that happened to women, that would have been that would have been an epidemic. We don't have to judge ourselves by the standards of other people who are eating like shit and not exercising and not healthy. We can well put. judge ourselves by our own. Yeah. Or at the very least, historical standards. What have right. what have men been for the longest time? All right, let's go with that. <laughs> That um, sounds good to me. Yeah, why not? All right, Pedro, hopefully that answers your one. Um, we were, actually, you know what? Finish this off, and then I was going to get to an article you had sent me. And it's actually, I do remember now. Um, I remember following you like a year or two ago, and then I lost track of you for a while. And for the longest time, I was like, I know this guy. I know this name. Why the hell <laughs> do I know it so well? Mm -hmm. And then once you sent me that article as a starting off point there, it was like it completely cleared up for me. I was like, oh, yeah. I remember now because it was at the time there was a ton of feminist hit pieces and you came in with something a little different, which was like an outside perspective on, I guess, praxeology here, which I found an enjoyable read anyway. 
I publish on Medium and Rolo's been on Medium and he's given up. He posted a few articles years ago. They're still up there. But Medium is a shit show of feminism. Um, really? And there's good re well, yeah. They, they pay, there's no ads. Um, they support themselves with subscribers. And so you got to ask yourself, who are the type of people besides college professors that make ice baths that have the time <laughs> to sit around all day and read medium shit? And who are the people who are going to pay the $5 a month to get the unlimited access? It is not guys who are trying to earn a living, you know, topping trees or mining gypsum or something like that. It's a bunch of women sitting around that reinforce one another's worldview, write articles about masturbation and cheating on their husbands and things. I've blocked like 60% of what medium shoves in my feet. Really? So you might say, why am I on medium? Um, first of all, uh, it, it does work for me in this way. Medium pays me for my articles and it's not a lot of money and it doesn't make a difference in my lifestyle, but it gives me feedback about what people are reading. Um, oh, so they're paid based review. on viewership. Correct, which is why there's so much clickbait crap on Medium. You really need to sort through it. But the other thing that it helped me sort out was consolidation of praxeology, consolidation of preventative medicine. When I started reading the solipsistic, self-referential lies that women would tell themselves on Medium, it was sinking into me that what Rollo was trying to teach us wasn't just based upon outlying experiences. It helped me see the, the way that preventative medicine is um, describing hypergamy and the natural arc of a woman's evolution and read it as something that I could interpret faster. Huh. Actually, that reminds me of something. What was it called? Deception theory? I don't know how into the, like the evolutionary psychology circles you are, but there was the theory on why that was happening. That's because the women absolutely believe all the stuff that they put on there, whatever. I'm not here to talk shit about that. But the idea is that from an evolutionary perspective, there's always that push and David Buss and Cindy Minson talk about it too. There's that push for deception and then the push for detection. So mm -hmm. from a guy's perspective, we learn... You know, we lie to a girl, say we love her, so she'll sleep with us. For a girl, she'll lie saying it's your baby, and then he'll take care of it. And those are extreme examples, but you get where I'm going with this. But then an evolutionary adaptation we had, and it's mostly on the female side, but on the male side too, where if we can lie to ourselves, we can lie to other people without giving any signals because we're actually yep. very bad liars and people are good at detecting yep. it. But it was when it's weird because when you were talking about watching soccer moms talk about cheating on the hubby with Jax and how do they jerk off or Jill off properly. It just made me think of that one there, which, and this is why I love science, man. Well, I not science, but the guys in science, anybody with a PhD is cool in my books. <laughs> well, then cause yeah, we, cause we were talking and it was about the cold baths and stuff. And obviously the first thing I went to was that cold shower, your way to masculinity, but I'm going, you know what? At the very least I could be wrong. I have been wrong before. In fact, most of the time I am. And looking into it, it's actually been fascinating how much of this stuff has clicked in that same way. Like when you're talking about adipose tissue, uh, dropping weight just from the cold weather. Like when I'm, I'm from a small town in BC, negative 40, which I think is about even for Fahrenheit and Celsius in the winters. It's, yeah, it's that, the crossover point. Yeah, <laughs> it's the crossover. Uh, <laughs> what? It doesn't matter. Fahrenheit, Celsius, it's the same damn temperatures. Your spit still freezes before it hits the snow. Yeah, but then it was mm -hmm. funny because I, I never really put two and two together. But then seeing you talk about the cold therapy and I'm going, dude, I got friends from high school who had something going along like that. He was fat. And then in high school, he ended up joining like skiing and that kind of crap. And all of a sudden he goes like my brother was a fat kid, huge fat kid, thinned right out in high school. And that was really the only thing that changed in our lifestyle is we started skidooing. So we were out in the cold all the time. Yep. So then I'm like, I got I got to. I got to pick this guy's brain and I know I've been talking too much and I need you talking more. So I'm just going to leave it on that, but let's go back to the alpha article. If you guys haven't right. read it, did I put the, did I put the link in the description on that one? I think I did. If not, I'll throw it in the chat to you guys. Give it a check yourself too. I think it's a great read. I like it. Um, if you're on medium, why don't you stick it to feminists? 
give the man a subscription <laughs> too. I mean, well, because you're essentially right. It's a magazine. It's an online magazine. Right. Which is kind of neat. And I wouldn't mind seeing it work. It worked better. And, you know, if more guys sign up to this stuff, less feminists do. And then it tends to be more geared to the stuff that, you know, vote with your wallet. Mm -hmm. But was zoology really the first place they came up with alpha? Like, was that the, the first scientific use of alpha? Because I know it usually from like radio signals where there's alpha waves, beta waves. I know neurosurgeons use it as well. I don't know. A lot of people dip into the Greek alpha bet. So I don't know that. I mean, alphabet is literally alpha beta. Um, so the alpha, the word alpha gets used a lot of different ways, a lot of different times, but in yeah. zoology, it is the, the subject, the animal that comes first, just yeah. like in the alphabet. And so for these highly socialized animals, wolves, most primates, um, because there's the social hierarchy, the dominant male is called the alpha male. So in this article, I talk a lot about the zoologists who know more about it than I do. Franz Duval, he studied chimps. There are uh, these two women who wrote books called Zubiquity and Wildhood that draw analogies between the animal world and the human world. And these analogies can be very informative of our own social dynamics. The difficulty is that we're trying to have a civilization. And last I checked, that's not what hyenas are trying to do. So no. our social hierarchies are more complex. It used to be that a female could assess the male's capacity to provide and protect just by looking at his physiology. Mm -hmm. uh, is he big? Is he strong? Is he fast? Yeah. Can he fight she off a cave bear? <laughs> you got it. But, but that doesn't say anything about his commitment. So when you think about hypergamy, and there's a great book by Tim Burkhead called Promiscuity. Uh, Rolo's read it. He cited it. And it talks about the science of hypergamy. When you go way back before civilization, hypergamy was a matter of assessing the male's capacity to provide and protect and then assessing commitment. Except now provide and protect cannot be assessed at a glance because we have money, because we have these complex institutional structures. Maybe the guy is short and fat and he's loaded. That is, women have to depend upon other cues to besides physiology to understand whether the man can provide and protect. So the alpha analogy with animals, it goes so far. The further we go or the further a woman develops past adolescence, the more complex the analogy becomes and the more it breaks down. Breaks down. Because mm -hmm. that's what I was going to say, the same thing, because most guys who critique it or most guys who think they know it, they just want to be the wolf. If I go, if I go into a room and I don't get the first cut of meat, then I'm not alpha, which I'm with you. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. And that's another reason why I was kind of drawn to this one because you kind of, instead of me, I just call the guy a retard and move on. But oh, yeah, I am not supposed to say that anymore. Apparently <laughs> I guess the R word is now a forbidden word. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you mentioned, and uh, that is not that case anymore. The social signaling, just like you said, but the part that I enjoyed about it is where you talk about the freedom which I think is a wonderful social signal. And I think it's one that appeals more and more lately. Because I think, and I don't have any science to back this. I don't have any references. And you're going to have to quote me if I'm wrong here. For most guys, you have your nine to five job and you're kinda, your time is, your time is doled out based on survival. And in the same way that a tan used to be a, a low value stigma, a s signal that showed people that, well, he has to work in the field. So he's right. not going to be able to protect me. He's not going to be able to provide that. That freedom is kind of a, a social signal in a way. Well, this guy has the luxury time between nine o'clock and five o'clock. So clearly he's able to survive without having to be in an office. You got it. Now, the thing that gets me is how that doesn't tap into a guy's need for bravado. <laughs> I'm sure like you've been on Twitter. I'm sure you've seen it. Guys are showing off this, that, and the other thing. And the one thing they never show off is the amount is that, like, I've never seen the flex that, guys, I have 12 hours a day to jerk off on Twitter and I can still feed my family. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> I had no question Maybe to follow true. up with this. I just thought it was yeah. funny. Yeah. 
I'm having more fun on Twitter than I used to. The um, the trolls used to bother me, but I understand it better now. Um, and it can be uh, it can be a source of amusement. So I worry less about it. When I first started taking heat for things that I would write on Medium or on Twitter, um, it activated some kind of fear mechanism in me. Like, uh oh, I might be in trouble. And there are some good reasons for it. Not only, I'm not anonymous, and I work at a public institution where we are subject to public criticisms and sanctions for holding views that are not publicly approved. I've sort of worked my way through some of those fears and negative emotions. I haven't hit the point where I'm like, fuck it. Oh, um, so you don't have I'm, tenure yet is what you're saying. <laughs> no, I do. But oh. Tenure is not a guarantee of a job. It's just a guarantee of an orderly dismissal. You still got to watch out. Instead, what I've said is some things are worth it. Some things are worth taking the chance. Right. When I see Rolo pointing out how dangerous it is to shame men, how they wind up taking their own lives as a consequence of that, it activates in me that some risks are worth it, partly because I'm a teacher and I'm not a teacher for a paycheck. I'm just wired like a teacher and I don't want to change it. I can't help but form an attachment with my students. So maybe I'll post something on Twitter someday and it'll get me fired and I'll be in a van down by the river, but I'll have a whiteboard. <laughs> nice nineties reference. <laughs> he's not around anymore yeah, yeah. If only he had a cold if only he had cold that's baths, what i was issue. thinking cocaine is not the best is not the best therapy <laughs> well that's kind of interesting too because i know i've talked with uh well, before he was famous, Jordan Peterson and Jeff Miller, and they all kind of have that same impression of academia where it's walking through eggshells, which is strange to me because I was a college kid in the 90s, so it wasn't quite as bad then. Like I had instructors that would still say things that wouldn't fly by today's standards, and that was kind of cool. It's gotten worse. Yeah, and I so. agree with the teaching thing. My, I always say my most, uh, my most rewarding time for the military is when I was teaching at the fleet school. So then my question is, why why this issue? Is it just men in specific? Is it uh, the injustice of it? Or like, what's the motivation there? Other Or just like, I just want to help. There's tons of issues. You could have been about the environment, but you chose this one to kind of be a little more outspoken about. I'm just curious. You're right. I am about the environment. And I started my career about the environment. Um, it was changes in my personal life that put me on this different trajectory that started me learning about psychology and resilience and got me into ice baths. Um, and I've written about this on Medium as well. I think it was six years ago. I'm having trouble keeping track. But my wife came to me. We were out in Arizona and she said, I'm not happy and I want to go back to New York and take the kids. And this has been happening you know, every couple of years, at least in my marriage, it made sense because every time she would say something like that, I would rearrange her reality in an attempt to make her life better. So I had spent, you know, nearly two decades training her how to get more out of me. Rewarding but bad this, behavior, essentially. You got it. This time, um, I thought about it a little bit differently. I remembered who I was when we met. I remembered that I was attractive. I was um, a leader. I uh, had excellent prospects. And here she was married to a bespectacled 250 pounder. It just didn't work out the way that she dreamed. So I sat her down and I said, we're not moving back to New York. We're not splitting up, but you're gonna see some changes. And I started exercising. I started going to the gym with my kids. I read Robert Glover's No More Mr. Nice Guy. It's I a game changer, isn't it? Oh my God. Uh, the covert contracts were uh, an enormous revelation. 
the way that I existed in my marriage was just making things worse because I had a broken mental model about how marriage was supposed to work. Yeah. I picked up uh, Ethel Kay's Married Man's Sex Life, and that helped a lot too. And then six months later, my kids helped me realize that my wife was an alcoholic. You can't, I mean, this is a really difficult position to be in. I had made myself better, yeah. and that was step one. So I sat her down and I said, you've got a decision to make. You can either stay married to me and quit drinking, or you can keep drinking and be divorced. She went into a 12-step program. She sobered up. She got healthy. It was miraculous. And then, like well, a lot I think of guys... It was, though. That's just it. You just had your shit together and you weren't afraid to correct. enforce your You're boundaries. Right. <laughs> I, right. Yeah, I, I know miraculous is just a turn of phrase, but at the same time, I really don't want to minimize the role you had in that. You're correct. Um, it wasn't luck and it wasn't coincidence. It was a deliberate plan and it worked. Unfortunately, I wasn't all the way there and we're never all the way there, but I wasn't there enough. At this point, I hadn't read Rational Mail, for example. I wasn't even on the blog. We were going to counseling, uh, like a lot of people who think they're as I think in a situation like that. And we'd been to about our third counselor. And the counselor said something like, but what about you, Tom? Now, I know better than to make counseling about me. We're, this isn't for my <laughs> emotions. You know, this is like theater to entertain my wife and keep her like feel better that we're working on stuff. But this guy pressed me and and she was like, yeah, you know, what about you? I said, okay, let me tell you a few <laughs> things about me. Lean and back. That, <laughs> right? That 10 minutes was the end of my marriage. We were divorced before we were in the, in the parking lot. I haven't yeah. even unlocked the minivan. This tells you what my <laughs> life was like. And she's like, I want a divorce. And every other time, it'd been like, no, no, honey, we'll work. And this time I said, works for me. We split up and I went deeper into trying to understand the way the world works. How do women think? What are they working on? How do I work? And I needed to know what was going on in my brain. I doubled down on everything to make myself better. And that's yeah. how I discovered Cernovich's Gorilla Mindset. That's how I discovered sh Cold Showers. That's how I discovered Vim Hoff and Scott Carney's book, What Doesn't Kill You. That's how I wound up doing an ice bath business. Yeah, which it, and it sounds like it's been doing well. It's funny, by the way, when you were telling that story, there's so many little pithy shorthand term phrases we use that you kind of like <laughs> walked perfectly into. Um, like, well, no, I don't, I don't, I, well, I, but that's the praxeology thing. A lot of guys had very similar stories. And so we're like, okay, so this is a good concept. We can either give it this long drawn out name that nobody remembers, or we can call it like operation scorched earth or all threats will be honored. Or, uh, I'm actually, and I'm, I, I'm going to take a guess. Let me know if I'm right. So you said three marriage counselors. I'm going to guess the first two pretty much just took we're taking sides and acting as the authority between you two guys and it wasn't working out because then they're the authority and then as soon as she gets emotional she doesn't listen to whatever they say anyway is that fair hmm. um her idea of counseling is uh i'm married to a man who's really smart and he has a doctorate i need to find someone else with an education equivalent to his to tell him what to do um mm, i didn't understand the that until, right. And we kept running through counselors because she couldn't find one that that could make me do anything. Uh, I, I can't even be controlled by the PhDs at my university. Not some, you know, masters in psychiatry or something is going to tell me what to do. She was very frustrated. But I'll tell you one story. Um, she had her own counselor, therapist, whatever the word is. And I came in for a session and we were talking about date nights and whatever else about compromise. And <laughs> we both wanted to spend more time together. 
And so this therapist said, well, wife, uh, you know, how about you trade off? Uh, you pick one night a week and the first week uh, you choose what to do. And the second week, Tom chooses what to do. And you can go back and forth. And wife said, well, that sounds pretty good. He says, Tom, what do you think? I said, it'll never work. He says, why? I said, because it puts us in a competition with one another. I'm going to have to go watch, you know, When Harry Met Sally. And then to get another back 90s at her, reference. <laughs> right? To get back at her the next week, it's going to be like, no, uh, I got tickets to the hockey game. Or it's like we just keep choosing things as if we want to extract the most concession out of the other person. The therapist listened. I said, here's what we're going to do. I will pick every date night. And of course she said, why is that fair? I said, no, 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 no. When I pick the date night, I have to pick something that I know you're going to enjoy because it's my choice. I'm not going to have a good time unless you're having a good time. So something I can tolerate and you can enjoy. And now all the responsibility is on me for whether we enjoy our date or not. Therapist said, all right, uh, wife, what do you think of that? Tears, upsetness, crying. We did it for 30 days as an experiment, and it was great. Mm -hmm. 30 days are over, and here's where I screwed up. At the end of the 30 days, I stopped picking the date nights. A week later, she's like, hey, what happened? I said, you only agreed to this as an experiment because you were so dysregulated in the therapy thing, and we've done our month, and, and now we kind of have to have a new conversation. She goes, that's not what I said. <laughs> Dude, that is so textbook. You have no idea. Like the you taking the lead thing. I, I even, it's so common. I just actually put out a video on it talking about how guys, the reason that guys need to just get it and take the lead is because girls are absolutely terrified of doing that because there's a chance of failure attached to it. And correct. Neuroticism is huge. I don't know what the difference is between men and women, but I know their bell curve is far shifted to the right of ours. Our one out of 10 events are their eight out of 10 events. There are really important differences between uh, men and women um, when it comes to anxiety. So I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna use this different word, anxiety, that people understand instead of neuroticism. Um, it's probably better. When I went to Al-Anon, I learned some, so many really important things. And the first one was the guys there said, Tom, you are an ass. And I said, <laughs> I'm not the alcoholic. I'm the one who has to raise the kids by myself. I'm the one who can hold the job. I'm not the ass. And they said, you're an ass because you treat your wife as if she was a grown woman. I say, but she is a grown woman. They said, no, she's not. Her development stopped the moment she started drinking. Whatever age that was, she no longer grows up because the alcohol damages her brain and stunts her development. Instead of her learning how to manage her own emotions, she gets, just gets drunk. You married a developmental 16-year-old in a 36-year-old woman's body, or by this time, 46. The point, they said, was you are never going to be any use to your family or your marriage until you learn to treat your wife like the emotional 16-year-old that she is. And if you expect her to be a grown woman, you're an asshole because her brain is not capable of doing it. And I was like, fuck. I'm the <laughs> it's your right in the research. <laughs> fuck it. Yeah, right? Because they were right. You don't ask someone to fly around the fucking room like Peter Pan if they don't have wings. I was asking my wife to function like a grown adult capable of making decisions because that's what my mother taught me I was supposed to do. In her case, she's not capable. All I do is throw her back on her incompetent resources and hold her accountable for doing things she's incapable of doing. That's the kind of jerk I was. Yeah, which ties in exactly what we just talked about, that uh, yep. fear of failure, basically. Well, I wouldn't then, be surprised then if she sabotaged a lot of this stuff just so that failure wasn't on the table anymore. Correct. Not because she was consciously planning it out. It's not like she had the circles and the arrows on the chalkboard. <laughs> um, it was no, no, just, we just talked about self-delusion being the, being the key. It was her pathology. And her pathology was smarter than me. 
So I had a lot to learn. After we split it up, there's a lot in, in the red pill praxeology about an analog. You don't have to be an alcoholic to stop developing. All you have to do is find ways to make your way in the world without accepting the emotional challenges that might otherwise be required of you. There are two archetypes that stop developing at about mid puberty. Uh, the male archetype is the elite athlete. If you can throw the ball 92 miles an hour as a 16 year old, nobody gives a shit if you're emotionally regulated. If you, I mean, in Canada, when they pick you out as a 14 year old and put you in one of those hockey high schools, they don't give a shit if you're a nice guy or if you're capable of, I don't know, doing calculus or some other, whatever the hell it is. In nope, America, single direction. Right. It's football. Just tackle the fucking running back and you can be whomever you want off the field as long as you're not getting arrested during the season. <laughs> the, the male archetype fails to appreciate how what everyone else is going through because the world organizes itself around the elite male athlete sometime in the middle of puberty when that athlete is identified and it's very rare it could also be someone like a rock star rollo talks about his rock star days um however the female archetype is not rare at all the the male archetype must be an elite athlete the female archetype must have boobs and then <laughs> the thought it. versus like, the star athlete <laughs> Jeez. that's right talk about different goal posts <laughs> you can i'm 53 and so i date women who are younger than me like late 30s 40 they're uh post epiphany for the most part the more attractive they are the further out in their development the wall is and I asked this question, I'm not saying I'm a fun date, but I asked this question of a woman who used to be a model. And I said, at what age did you discover that drinks cost money? And she said, <laughs> what? what? <laughs> what's money, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was walking with another woman and we were having a nice walk and she said, hey, let's go down by, you know, th that area then with the stream and that looks really pretty. And I said, you mean on the other side of the no trespassing sign? She goes, yeah, but that, you know, that's just a sign. I said, here's the difference between you and I. You're thin, you're beautiful, you're blonde, you're Scandinavian. When the like railroad cops show up, you get like a, oh, dearie, honey, you know, you're not really supposed to be there. Yeah, and if My not, fucking ass water. gets, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at a $500 fine, you know, like there are different rules for you than there are for me. And no, I'm not walking down the utility right away or whatever. So it wasn't just, I mean, I learned this from my wife's alcoholism, but it's not just alcohol. A, an attractive woman discovers that she's attractive in late stage adolescence. The world organizes around her in a certain way where she doesn't have to be challenged anymore. What happens to the male archetype, the athlete that is no longer worth anybody or his body is no longer worth anything to anybody? Oh, I've seen that. My stepfather was that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know how to describe it other than a full-blown breakdown. Once, because yeah. those, because you're right. He was that guy, slept with half the neighborhood, all that stuff. But then he just broke down because he didn't have the mental models to even understand what was happening. All of a sudden, everything was turning on him. Uh, girls leaving him. Almost got in a fight with me. My brother was ready to hit him with the bat, all that stuff. But since he didn't have any tools, he just kind of went back to instinct. And at least from what I've noticed about instinct, guys, when they instinctually try to solve problems, we usually do it through anger and violence which are the two least attractive things that a guy can do. So the time when he most needs help, he's least able to signal it. You're right. And I find that crash to be just, it's just saddening to watch. 
And I think I've seen that. I don't see it as much in women. I'm not old enough for that yet. I'm not in the, I don't know what age it is that women finally have that moment where they start crying in their car, but I'm assuming that's in the forties. I don't know. You've, you've been around a lot of girls at different ages. So maybe you, I'll just assume 43 only because Dr. I've Babe learned... had that video of her crying in her car. <laughs> oh man. I, I missed that one. I have um, my own experiences. I don't need her video if I want to access that. Yeah, it's it's a bit gossipy, but yeah, it was just the point. She's crying in her car because she couldn't find a man. But it makes sense too, because I can see, like for my stepdad, for example, he didn't have anything from it. So all he had to do, all he could do was basically, you know, do cocaine, take his six months or however long until everything goes away and the emotion levels go down. And then he just starts back with what he knows how to do. Didn't it well enough for himself. For a girl, though, I don't know if that happens. Like, if you're... If you hit that wall hard, I guess, for lack of a better term, you start becoming really ugly. You've never had to be challenged. And now you're essentially, like you said, starting over. I can't see anywhere for that to go for most people then to get bitter. Bitter and angry, which makes a lot of sense. Correct. Because at least most of the people that I see, like, I don't know if you know this, one of our hockey legends, Don Cherry, just got cancelled. Because like yeah. angry middle-aged moms were mad because he said you people when he was talking about things like the controversy aside, it was always that same demographic of person that you could tell is like, man, you know, like 50 pounds ago, I bet you she was really pretty. Yep. And here's the, here's the funniest part of that. The girl that led the charge into getting him canceled and being very bitter about it, talking about this, her whole rant about it involved her getting bullied as a kid. And then people making fun of all these photos she had drinking with frat boys in college. So she was just like you said, that one where she didn't have to grow up past a certain point. But then there's a certain point where those same skills and those same values don't work anymore. And the only way it seemed to manifest itself was looking at the source of that and blaming whoever, in this case, the poor hockey Don Cherry. Rock'em Sock'em 15. I don't know if that's an 80s reference. I think that's an 80s. Do you remember the Rock'em Sock'em videos? I remember Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Oh, dude, it's like a Canadian right. staple. So there's these VHS tapes where it was just 90 minutes of like America's Funniest Home Videos format, but it was just guys getting cross-checked in hockey. <laughs> Always the hits that like the helmets were flying off, that McSorley one where he clips Buddy in the side of the head with the stick, gives him a concussion. Yeah, my, when my kids were little, I was like, they are not permitted to play a sport where it's legal to be beaten by a stick. You know, I, <laughs> well, it's not. I mean, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> uh, but that's so, kind of funny. It almost makes it. It's I don't. It's like a pitying, or it's not an enviable posi position anyway. Correct. I wouldn't like it, and I'm kind of they glad I was never that elite athlete. Both the elite athletes and the the women past what we call the wall. Um, have a really difficult problem to solve. And I can sympathize with them because they have not been prepared by their experiences of early adulthood mm -hmm. to make their way in the world in late adulthood. But I have yet to find someone that I could really help because they're so, the brain is plastic when you're a kid. Yeah. And it's resourceful and it's creative and you find solutions to whatever your problems are. Maybe um, you missed the exam in school and you go in and you cry and you complain to your teacher that you had your period and that solves your problems. Your brain is like, figured it out. Yeah. And then 30 years later, the brain is still stuck in what you it was very creative and resourceful when you were a child and congratulations. But the old solutions just become new problems because the context changes. We're not kids anymore. So yeah. what worked when you were 17, there's no reason to think it's going to work when it's 37. You have to test it and see. And the brain is a stubborn thing at that age. Well, yeah, it's the neuroplasticity because from what I remember, it just takes a lot of energy to rewire neural pathways. And it's Correct. energy that your body would rather not spend. So it would much rather... And it, that's why it takes... Now, I can't remember how exactly it was formulated, but um, the articles and the research I was reading on it was in order to increase your neuro neuroplasticity again, you essentially need some sort of trauma, something that's like life ending or something that builds that fight or flight response. Because without that, your brain has no incentive to change. But then once it taps into that survival instinct, which is the only thing we have that seems to be stronger, 
which makes sense. That's why a lot of guys have to be at like the lowest point in their marriage before they start uh, trying some new tools out or developing a praxeology or why. Uh, yeah, but basically, yeah, why? Same thing. It makes a ton of sense. It's also why I put myself into this 32 degree water surrounded by ice. When that happens, I activate my body's flight or fight like autonomic nervous system. I get an adrenal rush. My heart rate goes up. I get norepinephrine coursing through my body and everything physiological is saying, Tom, get the fuck out because this is life threatening. And then I breathe and I relax myself and I strengthen my parasympathetic nervous system. I bring my brain waves down. Which one's the so, parasympathetic? So there's two aspects of the autonomic. There may be three, but th there's the things that you can control that excite you and mm -hmm. things, oh, I'm sorry, that you can't control that agitate you, that, that get you excited. Um, the heart is one of those. You don't have to tell your heart to beat faster when you're running. But then there's the parasympathetic nervous system, and this is the one that calms you back down. The breath is between the two. You will breathe harder when you need more air, but you can also hold your breath if you put your mind to it. So uh, yogis do this, people who meditate do this. When I go into the ice, it's really important for me to control my breath so that I practice calming my body down in a situation that everything in my body is interpreting as life-threatening. My mood changes every time I do it, which is why I call it my meditation. And the idea is, what else is gonna happen to me that day? I just spent three minutes in the ice freezing my nuts off. I, and you know, nothing, nothing is going to be worse than this. Now it's not, I got to the point where the first five seconds are tough and now I'm really good at it. And then I can get myself to be like, this is a day at the beach. The point is it reminds me of how to regulate my emotions when those emotions are going to be taken charge of my body and my thoughts. Interesting. I never actually thought about it from a neuroplast neuroplasticity point of view, but that actually kind of makes sense. So I guess, uh, man, I, I know we've only got you for an hour running close on time right now. So let me know if we're going too fast, but I'm probably going to spend the next hour just sitting here navel gazing about it with the audience. <laughs> Hopefully Carl gets on, has a couple of drinks and calls me a couple, <laughs> a couple slurs. <laughs> I think you can count on him. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess, so you said you had to go at the hour, right? What I got to do is finish building this ice bath before I get on a plane to London. We're shipping two of them out to Malibu because Lady Gaga has been posting on Instagram about how she gets in the ice. And now everybody in the music business is like, hey, I want an ice bath. You know, but they don't have as much money as Lady Gaga. They don't have staff to like make it for them on tour. Right. So they call us and they're like, uh, can you guys hook me up? Well, I got to hook up a couple of people before I get on this plane. That's why I've said I only have an hour. Oh man, honestly, that's I'm humbled by that. Thank you very much. I mean, having to hook the <laughs> Lady Gaga entourage up with ice. I mean, that's like business wise, that's an awesome thing. And to carve an hour out just for me and a bunch of nerds to learn how to change their neuroplasticity on their own without having to have their wife try to leave them. I think it's fascinating good thank you yeah but uh so we'll get on that one guys check the links in the description Fuck, where's my thing though there we go so and i i actually spent five minutes for the cast trying to pronounce it properly uh, morozo morozco <laughs> morozco forge morozco forge.com where you can see more on this stuff make up your own decisions see the benefits of it um same thing medium.com slash at seager uh seager tp Links are all in here. It'll explain a lot of this stuff. Same as that alpha article that we were talking about. Thomas did a great breakdown of that one as well. Do check all this stuff. Follow him on Twitter. That's, uh, was it your Seeger TP on Twitter, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Follow all those stuff. Honestly, I would love to have you back again. Hopefully when we're not uh, stealing time away from other musicians that want their ice baths. But <laughs> yes, thank you so much for coming on. And I guess any parting nice words from the guys pleasure. before we let you go? I was just checking the comments. I've been focusing on our conversation and I haven't uh, read it. 
God damn it, Return of the Mac. I get that John Stewart shit all the time, but I'm taller. <laughs> oh my God, now that he mentioned it, it actually makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny maybe i'll make that the advertising stuff for this hey john stewart came on the show to talk about ice baths you can tell him just don't let him listen and they'll believe you all right and then just know so at the very least i'm going to be altering my disdain for cold showers well the shower still but the baths i'll leave those alone because it sounds i'll probably try hey. it myself and let you know how much have you disdain for all you want. If it doesn't work for you, it's no big deal. Um, <laughs> and the point that I'm making is it's not to be more masculine. It's just to be better, whether you're problem. a man or a woman or whatever. Yeah, because the, the problem I have with more masculine is, is like I'm trying to sell this to women too, Ryan. And <laughs> you're making it sound like they're going to come out of the ice with a beard or something. And that's not <laughs> what's going to happen. See, that's great. That means we agree. All right. That's Anyways, true. so yeah, finish Thank your you bath, catch me. your flight. Yep. Thank you very much, and I'll catch you it's later. It's been a pleasure. It has. All right. Uh, da -da. Okay, guys, going to take a quick break here. I'm going to send him a thank you because, honestly, that was very interesting, and I liked it a lot. So tell me in the chat, what do you think about that? Have I been too hard on the cold shower? Should I be going off on it or what? <laughs> yes, Sarah, this is real. So that's kind of interesting. I'm going to have to to follow up on that one and to see what effects those have. Because I would think about my sailor time. We used to have cold showers all the time because our ships never had enough hot water. So we would take what they called pusser showers, like 30 seconds, quickly rinse under there, absolutely ice cold. Never remembered having productivity problems at work too, but it could have just been because we're at sea and we didn't really have anything else to do but work. But... But yeah, I agree too. Gravity blasts do give them a high five. Yeah, anybody, if you guys uh, are down in the Arizona area, feel free. Say hi. Thank him for his time on the show here. I do want to have him back though. That was a blast. <laughs> then Megan, of course, Tony Robbins does this. Yeah, that's... <sighs> yeah. When I make fun of guys for their cold showering their way to masculinity, it's it's that narcissistic archetype where masculine men do something, so I'm going to do it and I'll be masculine. And I think Anthony Robbins with his power of positivity stuff is kind of like the quintessential marketable commercial version of that. And I don't like it. But at the same time, I mean, he came in and he gave me a really brock solid case as to why it's a good thing. Gave all you guys discussions on it too. And it, it makes sense because it aligns with what we kind of already do. Yeah, or he's a really good salesman. But I'm the same way. But I mean, it shouldn't be too hard. All you need to do is fill your bath up with cold water or go run outside. In the, I mean, it's winter right now. It's December. We could easily run outside in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and see what happens. And I guess, so it's funny too. And then, so for a lot of you guys that are just here, we're just here to listen to the doc. Thank you for sticking around if you're sticking around. Um, the format of these things is usually pretty casual. And the one thing I always like is Carl's going to be coming back. I guess he just sent out a tweet, but it was too late for this one. He might join us here for the second hour. We'll see what he says. But he's finally starting to get better. So most of the time we kind of do this where we sit here and we riff on all this stuff that's absolutely ridiculous and focus on some actionable stuff. And then, oh yeah, that was the other one. So unknown unknown brings up something here. He's talking about, or wait, not you. Sorry, sorry, Conky. Uh, what was his name? Jack Kraus. Yeah, so I'm going to have to look him up. I've never heard anything on it. I have no idea what it's about. Like I said, I just know the good doctor because he's very, he's good as an outside observation of uh, TR, of like red pill in general. And I love those things. There's so very few of them that are switched on guys who aren't invested in, I don't know what to call it, I guess a system for lack of a better word, but because there's always that nagging and anybody who does red pill for any length of time, there's always this nagging thought in the back of your head is, is this just a circle jerk? Is it just a bunch of guys reinforcing stuff? Are we doing that pigeon dance I had talked about before? And so when you have an outside person who's coming in in good faith to see if there's anything that they can take from it, that's valuable. That's when you tend to get a much more nuanced opinion. And I think out of all, well, I mean, <laughs> 
Yeah, Ricardo, thank you for the shirt. No, this one's actually, it's not even a fancy one. It's just an H&M. So don't even worry too much about it. All right, what else is Jack Cross about? Photo biomodulation. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so something really stuck with me that he was saying at the end there was, yeah, he's also got to sell these to women and it's fixing biological situations here. It's not so much masculine things, which I think is neat because you don't need to sell everything on being raising your testosterone. <laughs> you can't derive a knot from it is. I was actually very impressed and uh, humbled that he was telling a story too about his ex-wife and his marriage and that, as well as going off about his uh, new wife and stepkid and that, that you don't see guys with that level of candor, honestly, because we've had to, for the married red pill, for the most part, we've had to have guys completely anonymous in order to get any kind of honesty out of them because the social consequences of guys expressing any kind of hardships are always fairly strong. So at the very least, even if, and it's obviously not the case, but even if everything he said was absolute bullshit, just getting that level of honesty from a man, like you gotta give, you gotta give credit and respect. I only wish Socrates was that good. <laughs> um, Steve Dean, William ices his balls. You guys are harsh, man. You guys are very harsh on these guys. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about that, and it's funny because he didn't really come into that marriage with any red pill understanding at all, but it hit all the same notes. Like for a lot of times, seeing Brifault's Law, if you guys have read the old post from No Ma'am where he first talked about it, it's where girls aren't incentivized to mature past a certain age. And then having alcoholism done as a more universal example of that, or the male elite athletes, it kind of lets you know like these things are part of the human condition which i find interesting as hell and it's kind of nice because we don't really talk about that because the one thing it's not that i fear it's just i know this is what ruined the pickup community um, pickup used to be about i want to be able to sleep with more women and so what do i learn about that what ended up happening was a bunch of women ended up calling it manipulative it got a bit of bad press and then guys immediately kind of switched the purpose of it oh no 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 no, no. it's not about sleeping with women it's about uh, self-improvement or being your best self. And it was right then that we lost pickup as, a, as an art form, I guess. I can't really think of what to call it <laughs> as a marketing gimmick, whatever whatever word you want to use to encapsulate the, uh, the idea of it. But that's when you lost it because then it no longer was focused on the guy solving a problem for himself. In that case, I want to learn how to sleep with more women or to be more attractive. And that's my one concern for Red Pill is when we start focusing not on male sexual strategy, but applying like a universal a universal humanization. It's another reason I really like outside sources because for me as from the red pill, I would never begin to describe how this form of uh, emotional stunting or emotional plateauing would stop for guys because we're not having sex with guys. So we didn't really care. But it's really interesting to see on the flip side of the coin what the equivalent would be. Also kind of funny, the fact that you have to be a top tier, top 1% athlete to have the same experience of the average thought growing up. So I don't know. I just, I found that one kind of, it, kind of funny, it kind of lays into the Pareto principle. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is, this is the, this is the big reason I hate it is because a lot of guys who try to sell you on the cold showers, they're doing it on testosterone boosting benefits. I find the best methods of boosting testosterone are A, working out, and B, taking a stack. D-ball and trend. And for the guys who think that cold showers ups your testosterone, they're the kind of guys that avoid hard work, which is why they don't talk about just work out more. And they're the ones that don't want to step outside of the box and take any risks. And those are the guys that are afraid to take steroids or they'll call it cheating. Personally, I don't care. Do what you want. But at the same time, if bringing your testosterone up is such a big deal, you don't need to make these stupid dances to do it. You're better off, you know, if you really want it, go work for it or go take a bit of a risk in your life. And yeah, changes your mitochondria, your hormonal system starts working more efficiently. That's all. This is like supplements. And that's, again, I'm going to talk about the tea on this supplements are really good to supplement they're that extra five percent so if you've got your workouts on point your diets on point 
you don't have BPD in your, uh, I think that's what those called, those plastics that are in the bottles that are leaking estrogen into you. You're not eating a bunch of unfermented soy. If you got all those things in place and then you're still having issues, not getting to a max level, I would say, yeah, if you think the, the, the cold shower is the ultimate be all and end all to get to that 95th percentile and your possible testosterone output, go for it. But I find most guys who do this for that reason completely miss out on the low hanging fruit because it's harder. Having said that, I do agree with the uh, the calming effects or what did he call it? The uh, sympathetic nervous system. Because I know cold water is really good for calming you down. I mean, swimming, I found in general for that. Yeah, you don't really need supplements if you're designed through evolution. At the same time, supplements are there just in case. All right. I'm going to take a quick pause here. Quick message out to Carl. We'll see if Carl wants to join us here for the next uh, 20, 30 minutes. If you're a veil. So we'll see. If we get lucky, he'll be able to join us. Otherwise, uh, from what I understand, Rule Zero is on this channel today. Excuse me. We're going to have a full cast. I think John's on a flight, so he's going to miss it. But I'm pretty sure everybody else may be back. So you're just going to have to tune in and see. Um, for those of you guys who are new to the channel, you just came to see uh, the good doctor talking about his cold metabolic uh, health stuff and alpha males in the wild then feel free, join this one. I think you're going to like it. It's a bunch of guys just as switched on as me, if not more, talking about the same sexual strategies. And it's all going to be the internal locker room talk. So it's a good time. It's a good time. Yes. And as I've got, I'm giving it a 75% chance Carl is on RZ today. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> one man, wait. Thank you for the $10 super chat. Dude, That is that is the line that wins the internet today. <laughs> every chick in a bar is mentally 13. It makes a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. And you know what? We have nobody to blame but ourselves. There's a reason that guys tend to mature more over time. It's because we're kind of forced to. Once you put more challenges and hardships in front of somebody, they're forced to. And if you're, if you're a girl that everybody wants to have sex with, they're going to do things to hopefully win your favor. So you're going to have a completely skewed word, worldview. I know we've talked before about, oh, focus. I know we've talked before about how uh, guys that are naturals are not the best guys to take advice from hitting on women on because they have a very skewed worldview. If girls are leaving their husbands to go have sex with a rock star, what's he going to be able to tell them about life that he, that he thinks he knows? Nothing, really. At the same token, a lot of pretty girls, like the prettiest girls have the most skewed worldview, except for the occasional one that gets a man who doesn't put up with her crap. And I've seen this experience in my own life. My uh, little sister, complete party girl, out of control. Um, the first guy that she met, still with him today. They're living together. They just bought a house. The first guy she met that told her no and stopped putting up with her nonsense, she straightened right up because it was a guy she was interested in. But then none of her old tricks and her old mental models were working. So none of that manipulation worked. And so she had to develop new systems. And a lot of the times... With a boy and a girl, it's very easy, just like the good doctor was saying. I'm going to pick the place. We're going to go there. And obviously, I need you to be in a place that you're going to have fun or I'm going to be miserable on it. So you're just going to have to trust me. So he essentially, uh, we call that a coming to Jesus speech. And that usually comes in a position where somebody is open to being submissive to, to her man. And that's where the leadership comes in. And I found that hilarious that he brought that up and how it works so well. Also found it hilarious how we went to the exact same issue that most guys have when that does happen. So they do something and it ends up being exactly what solves the solves the problem of the relationship. The girl wants responsibility removed. She wants to be given boundaries and an idea of what mental models will be helpful for her and her relationship. As the guy, your job is to give it to her. And then everything works out well. And then here's the problem that most guys have. Once that happens, you'll find guys think it's oh good i've done all this work now i can go back to the old way of doing things like rewarding her i i told her exactly what she has to do what restaurants to go to for the last 30 days and that's probably pretty controlling so now we're going to relax as we can go back to the way things used to be and then here's the problem and the doc said the exact same thing once he did that the girl got kind of she got kind of mad she's like hey why'd you stop 
And he goes, yeah, because we talked about it. This is just going to be something to test it out, see how it worked. But now I don't want to, I mean, obviously it's easy to quarterback from an armchair, but I don't want to say it would have had a difference on the sake of their relationship, but it wouldn't have hurt it if he'd have kept going down that route for sure. I mean, I've seen that before on my side too. Sometimes it's just something simple. Just being able to make decisions can offer an amazing amount of not just stability, certainty, and comfort in a girl, but it actually helps her develop the proper mental models. And I think for a lot of brands, wink, wink, a lot of brands that are out there, they keep talking about being the patriarch and being the leader, except for they mention no discussions at all about developing healthy, emotional, mental models for their women, which is really what they mean, what you mean by leadership, whether you know it or not. Leadership is helping other people align their best interests with the group's best interest, or in the relationship's case, your best interests. So we're going to go, I think we're going to cut this one down at 1030, because honestly, that's been so much fun. I don't know where else I can take it other than to break down the doctor's stuff, especially with his relationship, alcoholism and all that, and then uh, continue to fluff them. So on that note, uh, if you want some questions, feel free. Super chats are always open. I'll make sure to find time for you guys if you're in there. I'm going to go back to one man's way thing here about the, the bar chick mentality. I... <laughs> Kong, you got your airtime today. Take the dislike down. Ribney, you're such a jerk. <laughs> But um, so back to the one man's way one, it's most guys who have hit on a girl. Have you ever been to the place where it's a really attractive girl and you hit on her and it's not that you get shot down, but she's just absolutely rude, like no politeness whatsoever. Any guy at the start where he's not naturally good at it. What's up, Jack? Any guy who's not naturally good will have that moment in his life where a girl shoots him down harshly, embarrassing him in front of everybody. Um. If he's a more self-actualized or, you know, ego invested man, that's usually when the guy calls the girl a lesbian and like, oh, whatever, dismisses her, whatever he can. But what a lot of guys do is they end up doing the, what I call it is the MGTOW technique, where you automatically try to elicit sympathy to somebody who's clearly not sympathetic. But here's the point, And I think this is where uh, one man's way, his uh, statement there makes a lot of sense. If you're a girl, you get hit on constantly if you act like a damn fool and nothing changes, well, then what incentive does she have to act nice? So that's my thought. Same as clothing. I know a lot of guys make fun of when you see like high fashion and a lot of hipsters, hipster girls, what they wear. And the stuff is absolutely ridiculous. Well, part of it is a flex, but part of it is because of a skewed set of mental models because there's been no feedback from the outside world. If a girl is cute enough, good looking enough that she can wear a fucking garbage bag with a sun hat and still have people taking photos of her, putting it into magazines, if guys are still hitting on her, well, then why is she going to dress nice? She has no incentive to. As far as she knows, she can wear absolutely anything she wants and everybody will still give her exactly what she wants, attention wise, what have you. And to follow through on what we had talked about earlier, where it goes back towards the wall, that girl will start doing stupider and stupider things, wearing goofier makeup. We'll use the, uh, wearing a meat, a dress made out of meat, all that stuff. Then they hit the wall to the point where their looks are no longer good enough to have these flexes work. And that's where you always see, I'm anybody who's lived in a big city, you've probably seen that the older lady who's just dressed fricking weird or has like the most worst makeup or all that kind of stuff. And you wonder, how did nobody in her life tell her that she looks absolutely ridiculous? And that's why. Every crazy, ugly old lady you see was used to be a hot thought who never got told no. And I'm willing to say this with 99.9% .9 certainty. <laughs> I'm going to leave that topic there. But yeah, listen to Conk. Somebody respect me for more than internet achievement. Lame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah jack brings up a good point too this is the roosh article how hot girls treated where he dressed up as jesus as an experiment i kind of miss old roosh i really hope whatever whatever's going on in his head he gets that sorted out 
Because I would love it if Roosh got back to like daybang Roosh. I think that would be very nice. But yeah, it's because yeah, they can get away with it. And it doesn't help when nowadays, because of the social media acting as a force amplifier for a girl's attractiveness, that we end up with fours and fives with this same attitude. I call it Navy hot. Um, what happened is we'd have a bunch of girls on ship. It was usually about 10% of the ship's company. So 20, 25 women for the most part. You'd go out to sea and you're stuck out there for 35 days. And that's the only 20 women that are around. You start to develop this weird sexual hierarchy. A bunch, most guys will be very thirsty and give those girls tons of attention. And those girls will start getting inflated egos, especially after the, uh, they put on the PO, the popcorn PO. That's the joke that after, you know, a couple years of the deep fried food on the galley that girls end up getting, you know, giant, giant asses. But the funny part of that comes once you hit a foreign port. And I think that's an interesting phenomenon that I've not heard or seen anywhere else. So these girls become like the top of the pecking order on ship. It's at the point where guys would fight over them too. It was the weirdest thing. A lot of guys end up having to get booted from ship. And if you were smart, you just avoided them like the plague. Nothing worse than having a hard four hit on you while you're trying to work out. And you're just like, not really hitting on you, but searching for validation. But here's the funny part. You hit a foreign port and then all of a sudden their value drops. They're like an eight out of 10, that mids watch. The next day in San Diego, they're a four out of 10. And a lot of the drama and hijinks that happens in foreign ports is largely because of that. It's like a miniature amusement park ride of a girl hitting the wall. I remember it was a little French girl, electrician. Um, I don't want to say her name on here, but we'll just call her Pierre. <laughs> I don't know why. It's the name I was thinking of. But she was just like that. She was on, I remember this because it was mids watches, which means it was always red light. So everybody can keep their night vision. She looks pretty good. Two weeks in, she looks gorgeous. A month in, oh my God, sleeping with her boss. Um, another guy was interested in her. They were having some issues there. Hit a foreign port. All of a sudden, none of the guys wanted anything to do with her. And then you put her under normal light. And I'm like, oh my God, what the hell happened? Horrible skin, acne, the works. Not the prettiest girl. Had a mental breakdown. Ended up getting drunk off of moose milk. She ended up throwing her boots, taking her boots off and throwing them at the officer of the day. Now, for those that don't know military, problem with that is you're assaulting an officer. And there's not many crimes that are bigger than that in the military. <laughs> so you don't do that. Um, yeah, it was pretty bad, but she got a girl pass out of it. Thank God. Uh, another girl, she was like, uh, she was like a three out of 10, but on board, she was like a seven out of 10. She ended up, uh, assaulting a bunch of guys that kind of didn't go anywhere. Cause guys thought it was kind of funny. Third girl, she ended up developing an alcohol problem, which was actually kind of sad. She would, uh, drink red wine, but she didn't like the taste. So she'd mix it with Coke. And I remember the very first trip we took with her and she ended up getting landed from this before the deployment is they found her at the bottom of one of the ladders right outside of her mess, just passed out wearing a bathrobe. Eventually the other girls had to drag her out because I mean, she's hanging out there in her underwear in the middle of the flats, drag her out, got her some medical care. But so I can kind of sympathize because I see it happen on a micro level. So I can see on a, life scripting level, somebody hitting that wall and all of a sudden losing that very positive worldview they had can be kind of a traumatic thing. So, <laughs> oh, I missed the chat then. What was the, uh, what's the parody account? I'm going to guess that's beach donuts. No shit. I didn't know those from the Basque reason. I figured I figured the French would have not liked anything mixed with anything. They ate ketchup on French fries. <laughs> I guess, so the point of this is then, what does it matter for a guy? If a girl's having a problem adjusting to things, getting her own mental models, that doesn't affect us. So what's the problem with that? I would argue it does matter, especially if you're in a relationship, because if you're one of those guys who's with one of the super hot model cheerleader types, then you really need to not coddle her at all. You got to kind of hold her to account. I mean, if you watch my last video too, we talked about how if you give a girl an opportunity for failure, she'll sabotage or like that were failures an option. She'll sabotage it on purpose just so she doesn't have to deal with that because of the anxiety that comes with it. 
And this is kind of where that relationship, how relationships are work, that's where that comes in. I would say giving a girl challenges to be her best, to not have to rely on the goodwill of her looks is probably a great thing. I don't think my girl actually got that. I remember early on in the relationship, she asked me, why did I love her? And I told her it's because she can drywall, to which she laughed at me, kind of punched me in the arm, that stuff. But I, that's there's some truth to that. Like her dad was a very good dad. Like he trained her, or not trained her, but he taught her to be, to be better than just a pretty set of eyes and a pouty set of lips. And I think for a lot of guys, they're kind of doing their daughters a disservice by coddling them. I always call it the one itis for your daughter. A lot of failures of fathers have failed their kids that way. Now, the problem is those kids end up in relationships with you and you end up on the subreddit complaining about how she doesn't have sex with you anymore and how she hates doing this, that, or the other thing. So my suggestion for you guys as a takeaway to this very female sympathetic topic, hold her to account little things and build up that tolerance, build up some healthier mental models, lead your girl into something better. Do what you can to take all the responsibility for failure out of the events because she's going to blame you anyway. So at least then you're getting past it. So for example, let's use drywall as an example. Let's say you're a master drywall. I'm not, she is, but in this case, we'll pretend I am and she's not. We're going to start drywalling the house. So I'm going to have her drywall with clear directions, simpler tasks. Just put the mud on the wall. I'll do the cleaning up. Maybe that works that way that time. Then maybe after that. <laughs> yeah, get your girl in an ice bath. <laughs> One man, I like you, man. <laughs> you got a quick turn of phrase and some good wit to you. Yeah, so with these little kind of challenges, and sometimes they're simple things. If you're just dating a girl, maybe having her come to pick you up to take you on a date that you're going on or just a little compliance tests. And it makes sense. Even from the old pickup days, Mystery used to do this all the time. He called, I can't remember what he called them, but he had a necklace and he would hand it to a girl who's like, here, hold this for me while he tells a story. And it's those little acts of compliance that really help because then it puts the girl in the, in the mindset that, yeah, it's not because I'm pretty. I don't have to know what a drink costs. It's that there's expectations put onto me. And with those expectations come challenges. And if you guys don't know much about girls or boys, I'll tell you this right now. A lot of us love the chase and we love the challenge more than the catch. The idea of not having somebody 100% kind of gives you that incentive to try a little bit harder. So is it more like a sangria? Can't believe you guys are on that, dude. That's like that's like a horrible thing, by the way. That's 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 the equivalent of lean, but PG 13. <laughs> Cause it's missing the coding. Um on that note, though, we're coming up on the half hour, so I'm going to cut this one a little bit short. You guys got an hour break. Grab yourselves some breakfast. I'm going to go say hi to the old lady, have another coffee, and enjoy some time together. Again, do give uh, the good doctor a look. I got the links in the description here. Go check out his Medium articles. If you kind of like that content, I would say subscribe to it. I mean, it's a magazine, essentially. You pay a couple bucks a month, and you get access to all the articles you want. Yeah, you might have to spend some time, and he said 60% of it is basically bored soccer mom feminism but if you can kill that i think you'll find there's a couple of good things in there i mean rollo was in there for a bit the only reason he didn't stick with it is because it didn't have enough traction so maybe you find it's the kind of articles that you find insightful maybe it's uh just the rage bait i mean you can go ahead and listen to donovan talk about how girls ain't shit but maybe just watching girls be shit and take the lessons from their self-delusion maybe you'll be able to have that work for you but at the very least, I would say check out the good doctor. He's worth it in there. Same thing as his ice bath stuff. I'm going to have to go check on that myself. I'm going to do a little bit more research. Um, I'll end off on this one only because this one actually came up in my Patreon earlier. So I've already got kind of a, a good answer towards it. Going out clubbing, logistics are terrible, and you can't pull. Get the girl's number after making out. All right, so you're asking how to do something when your logistics aren't in order, and in that case, you're just not. That's the first thing, is get your logistics in order. If you don't have a place to segue, if you don't have two or three different venues to be able to use time dilation or bridging, if you don't have a place to take her back, plausible deniability and a good reason to not pull up her anti-slut defects when you bring it up, 
Uh, I would say your clubbing events are terrible, and the best you're going to do is a K close, which is kissing or making out, or an N close, getting a number. And at that point, you're just starting out from zero. Problem with N counts now is it's it's Tinder. You basically just got the digits from a from somebody a swipe right on, and then you're starting from scratch. So all that work you put in at the bar up to that point was essentially just masturbation because there's nothing to come from it. All you have is the same thing you would have gotten by swiping right. So yeah, your logistics need to be in order. Um, the making out, I would say get that out of the way as early as possible to escalate as fast as possible. I mean, within people's comfort level because no means no, as we all know. But yeah, there's really no way to around it. Um, if you don't have logistics, sure, the stars might align. A friend might have a bedroom for you next door. You can go use it, but it's not those kind of things you can count on. So like anything, just like the good doctor was saying with this stuff, if you set yourself some good processes up, set yourself up for success, you'll be far better off. So on that note, I'm going to try out this cold bath and I'll see you guys in about an hour. So cheers. <laughs>